Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second day of our seventh annual neuroscience event. We start today with the session on the perspectives on neuropsychiatric disorders. Neuropsychiatric disorders are prevalent in society, yet our understanding of the biological basis of these disorders is severely limited. In today's session, we will hear from some of the top scientific experts in the field who have made great strides towards improving our understanding of the underlying mechanisms of dysfunction in these disorders. They will describe their novel theories and approaches which have allowed them to gain new insight into the myriad of factors that contribute to the disease state. Neural, social, molecular, and computational considerations drive forward not only improved understanding of neuropsychiatric disorders, but also better prevention and therapeutic avenues for them. It's an honor and a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this session, Dr. Andreas Meyer Lindenberg, who will be presenting on the environmental risk mechanisms for psychiatric disorders. Professor Meyer Lindenberg is the director of the Central Institute of Mental Health in Mannheim, Germany, as well as the medical director of the Department of Psychiatry and Psychotherapy there. He is also a professor and chairman of psychiatry and psychotherapy at the University of Heidelberg in Heidelberg, Germany. He is board certified in psychiatry, psychotherapy, and neurology. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. My name is Judy O'Rourke, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting questions during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions following his presentation. This presentation is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Andreas Meyer Lindenberg. Thank you very much, Judy. I'm pleased to be virtually with you and uh, talk about environmental risk mechanisms for psychiatric disorders. The reason we might be interested in a topic like that, I guess, becomes clear if you look at the burden that uh, mental disorders entail. This is a European studies. There are similar experiences around the world. But if you look at the European numbers, you can see at the bottom there that common psychiatric disorders, such as mood disorders, depression, but also psychotic disorders and anxiety disorders, have a tremendous cost of society, which amounts to more than 100,000 million euros a year for mood disorders, a burden that is much, much higher than that for other brain disorders and in combination about as high as that for common somatic disorder. So we have a huge problem here. We have disorders that are very prevalent and they're very severe. And so in order to try and fix this, the ideal medical response would indeed be prevention. We would try to prevent those disorders from ever happening. If you bring neuroscience into that conversation, that motivates a strategy in which you would like to analyze causal risk factors. What is meant by this is that you would like to go away from a patient with a manifest illness, such as schizophrenia or depression, towards the factors that we know are causally related to increase that person's risk, which in every illness you can decompose into genetic factors and environmental factors and the interactions between the two. And the reason you would like to do that is that you go in time prior to the manifestation of the illness, which might enable you to prevent them from ever happening. Now, many genes and many environmental risk factors have been found. Our research and the topic of my talk today will not be in finding new genetic and environmental risk factors. It will be about taking genes and environmental exposures that we already know about 
and ask the questions, how are they working? What's happening in the brain of someone who carries a gene is a question we often ask, but today we'll be more focused on the question, what happens in the brain of someone who has been exposed to an environmental risk or also resilience factors, and how does this increase or decrease that person's risk to become ill? And the hope is that that will give us insights into the neurobiology of risk and resilience that will enable us to intervene very early or perhaps even to prevent these illnesses from happening. And as I said, many of these environmental risk factors are well known. This is a overview slide from a paper in Jim Van Austin, in which he was looking at evidence related to schizophrenia. And you can see that there's a broad variety of risk factors that are shown here, all of which have been proven to be causal for schizophrenia risk with a very high degree of certainty, uh, much higher often than the certainty that given genes have for being associated with a mental disorder. And of those many risk factors, today we are going to focus on a few that have to do with the social environment. And the reason we're doing that is shown in this study. This is a study in which the authors compiled a lot of evidence on if you will, lifestyle factors, things that relate to people's behaviors that are known to be important for health because they prolong lifespan. They're good for your survival. So all of those things that you see here are good for your survival. But the point of the paper wasn't that. The point of the paper was to bring them on a common scale to so you can compare their impact. It's called effect sizes, what you see on the top here. And if you go down uh, and read your way up, you can see that a bunch of things that are often discussed as being important for health are, however, not having that big an impact. So for example, being lean versus being obese has a highly significant effect, but the effect is around 0.2, which is a relatively small effect size. Physical activity isn't much better. If you go up, you can see that not drinking, not smoking, that gets higher. But the one thing that in humans has a large effect on survival and therefore of health is the question of whether you have or you don't have a supportive social environment. If you have people who ideally love you, but also people who know you by name, who do you a favor, who help you in everyday life. And the size of this supportive social network is crucially related uh, with health, uh, with survival. And that applies, of course, even more so to mental disorders in which the social domain is critical. So based on that today, I want to talk to you about three established environmental risk factors for schizophrenia that uh, you see their uh, social status, migration and urbanicity or being born in cities. And I will ask the question of how do they work in brain? And I will argue that they represent specific kinds of social stress that are hard to process for brain that's already altered, for example, by background genetic risk, which is very important for several of the mental disorders we'll be touching on today. And I'm going to start us off with socioeconomic status. This is a paper from 2016 that I think many of you will have read. And the reason I think that is that it was one of the most highly discussed papers of that entire year. What happened in this paper is that researchers compiled a very large data set about income in the United States and related it to expected lifespan. And uh, you see here separately for men and women that at the very lowest income percentiles, you have some deviations from nonlinearity. It probably has to do with access to health care and lifestyle factors. But then you get into this very striking linear increase. The more you make, the longer 
you live. And even at the very highest percentiles, which in the US are households with income around 2 million, you still see if you go up 1%, you still have an increase of your lifespan of several weeks or months. And the total difference between the poorest and the wealthiest, or I should probably say the least earning, the most earning households is actually bigger than the lifespan impact of cancer as a disease category altogether. It's a very large effect that had been shown before, but not in this precision in such a large data set. And it means that your status is related to lifespan. And that is something that we don't only see in humans, we see it in all animals that have a social hierarchy, which is the vast majority of animals that do have social interactions. They tend to show hierarchies, and it therefore becomes a very interesting question to ask, how are social hierarchies mapped in the human brain? And to, to look at that, a bunch of years back, we did a functional imaging study that uh, you see schematically here. What we did here is tell people that we would do a rewarded game with them in an fMRI scanner, which allowed us to look at brain activity. In this case, the game was that the subjects had to watch a blue circle in the middle of the screen, which turned green at some point. They had to press a button. And when they did that within uh, a short time span, if they did it rapidly enough, they would be rewarded with money. And uh, that money they got to get home, take home in the end, which means that they were highly motivated to do that, to actually do play this game well. Then we told people, participants, that together with them, there were two other participants also playing that game. And we tested participants' reaction time before, and we told participants that their reaction time was in the middle of this group of three. We would give them two stars, but there was one other player who had three stars because it was a lot faster, and another one who was slower and who got one star. And we told them that whenever they played, one of the other two would also play, and they could see whether they won money or not, but they shouldn't think that it was an antagonistic game. It wasn't a competition. Whether they got their money only depended on their own reaction time. But we said, you can see how the other ones are playing, and sometimes we show you where you stand in the ranking based on how much money you won in this game. So in other words, what we did here is establish a pseudo hierarchy with those pseudo military star symbols, three, two, one, and uh, then ask how the brain processes this hierarchy. And of course, a lot happens in the brain when you're playing a game, you're waiting to press a button, you press the button, you're waiting whether you get reward, all of that. But on the first approximation, we didn't look at all of that. What we did is before each round, you can see there in the red circle, we showed which of the two other players was playing, the one with three stars, which was above in the hierarchy, or the one with the one stars was below, and then asked, is there a differential signal in human brain for seeing that someone above you in the hierarchy would be the three star or below you in the hierarchy and there would be the one star and you could argue maybe there shouldn't be any difference between after all that hierarchy was brand new. It wasn't relevant to how much money they got. We told them not to attend to these people. Uh, in fact, these people didn't even exist. Uh, we told that to the subjects only after the experiment. The reason they didn't exist is that we know from previous evidence that you can extract a lot of information about people's status from their pictures by attending to things such as age, gender, dress and so on. So basically, before each experiment, we made a picture of the subject and then we found pictures of two other people who were very similar, similar race, similar age, similar sex and so on, to control for these factors. So the question now is, is there a signal in brain for social superior, which would be a three-star player? And the answer is there's an enormous signal in brain when that happens, which encompasses the entire visual spatial attention system system, ventral striatum, hippocampus, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, basically a lot of brain areas that are related to attentional resources were uh, active, more active when you saw a social superior.
Next question, which brain areas are more active when you social, see a social inferior? The answer there was very clear as well. There were none. There wasn't even a single bit in the human brain that was more active to seeing a social inferior, which means that social hierarchies work by shifting your attention towards the social superior in the room. And there's now good behavioral evidence to back that up as well. So the processing of social hierarchy in human brain is relatively simple. Now, in the next step, we did something in addition, we repeated the experiment with a new group, but with a different game, just to be sure that the specific game wasn't important. And then we told people, well, you're two stars, but maybe you get better during the game, and then you could be a three-star player, or if you're really bad, you could fall back into the one-star position. So in other words, what we did is we made the hierarchy unstable. And we did that because we know from previous work that if you're in an instable hierarchy, losing your position is especially stressful. And so when we repeated the experiment in the unstable condition, we found again the same brain areas active when you see superior. Again, we found no brain areas active when you're an inferior, but now we found specific brain areas which were only active in the unstable condition. So those are ones that we should attend to if we are interested in the health effects of hierarchy and prevention. And those brain areas were amygdala, which you see on the right, which is a critical signaling structure for emotion and uh, also adversity. And amygdala was active more in people who paid more attention to hierarchies to whom their hierarchical position was more important, and also when they were about to lose their hierarchical position. And the other brain region you see there on the left in red, that's an area in the medial prefrontal cortex that we know, and we're going to talk more about this, has a regulatory function with regard to amygdala. So those two are uh, two brain structures that we should bear in mind. And I'm going to show you another example for risk factor next so you can see more of that circuit. And that other risk factor I would like to talk about is urbanicity or being born in a city. Uh, if you are born in a city, your risk of schizophrenia goes way up, it goes up by around triple, by 300%, which is the biggest known uh, environmental risk factor for that very debilitating disorder. If you currently live in a city, your risk for, depression, uh, for schizophrenia doesn't go up much more, but what goes up for people who currently live in big cities is the risk for depression and anxiety disorders, which go up around the world by a factor of around 40%, 30 to 40 to 50% on average. So being in a city currently increases your risk for depression and anxiety, and being born in a city really increases your risk for schizophrenia. And that finding, which has been known for over half a century now, has created a lot of studies to figure out, is this really causal, or is being born in a city a proxy for something else? And the answer seems to be, Yes, it is in some sense causal. And the other question is why? Why would that be so? How does that work? And one common idea that people had is that that might be related to social factors in cities, uh, that interactions in cities are somewhat more stressful. So to test this idea, a few years back, we did an experiment to try and look at whether there is indeed an impact on city living on social stress. So to do that, we used a variant of a stress task called the TRIA Social Stress Task. And that variant was uh, developed by a colleague who was in Canada at the time and adapted for imaging. And the basic idea of these tasks is that you're doing something stressful in front of an audience and given the impression that the audience disapproves of your performance. In this case, people were asked to do mental health, uh, sorry, mental arithmetic, like the equation you see up there. And uh, they were also given the impression that they were doing poorly. 
And uh, as you can see on the top right panel, that is stressful because you can see here that the stress hormone cortisol goes up. And we, of course, also after the experiment told people uh, about that experimental manipulation and uh, they told us that they experienced that as very stressful. So if you do this in imaging and compare it to a condition in which you also have to do cognitive tasks but aren't stressed, you can see a bunch of brain areas which are differentially active during social stress. You can see some of them in the brain slices in the bottom here. And that was known. So this is a social stress brain network, which is quite extensive. But we now had a more specific question. We were asking of those brain areas that are differentially active when you're stressed, are there any that are related to the size of the city you currently live in? And that would be, by the evidence we've just discussed, relevant for depression and anxiety disorder, and or are there any related to the site of the city when you were born. And that would be interesting for schizophrenia. And we got a relatively clear answer for both of those questions. So if you take city living first, the brain area that reacts during social stress to the size of your current city environment is amygdala again, which doesn't react much when you live in a rural area. And it reacts a little bit when you live in a smaller town, it reacts a lot when you live in a big city. And, and the lower row of this, you can see a replication that we did in this initial publication with a different sample. And this has now been replicated in several other samples as well. So the more, uh, the bigger the city you live in, the more your amygdala reacts. And that makes sense because as we have just discussed, Previously, with regard to social status, amygdala has the function of a danger sensor, as you can see there on the top left with the famous drawing with the snake. And so hyperreactive amygdala is something that we find associated with depression and anxiety disorders, which are exactly those disorders that you find increased in people currently living in a big city. So that suggests that we have a mechanism here that does indeed link social stress to risk for these mental disorders in city life. Now, what about uh, schizophrenia? So it's a question about urban birth. And that highlighted the area that you see on the left panel, both for the original and the replication study in the initial paper. That's, again, part of the medial prefrontal cortex. That's a part of the cingulate gyrus. And we call this pericingulate cortex because it is close to uh, the genue of the corpus callosum just adjacent to it. That was the brain area related to being born and growing up in a big city in your first years of life. And that's an interesting brain area with regard to amygdala, because in a previous uh, range of studies done at the National Institutes of Mental Health under the direction of Danny Weinberger, we looked at genes that show gene environment interactions. So the genes in the serotonin system and basically uh, the risk variants don't have a lot of impact if you are not exposed to environmental adversity, but if a lot of bad things happen to you during especially childhood, then the risk for psychiatric phenotypes such as depression or also aggression goes up. And studying the effects of those genes in brain, we found that they highlighted that exact circuit we've just seen between the perigenual cingulate cortex and amygdala and so we've come to think of those two brain areas which are linked in a feedback loop as a circuit for gene environment interaction. And so it's very intriguing to see that circuit show up by looking at a social risk factor such as urban birth. Now, the bad news for city dwellers don't stop at function. We also found that being born in a city impacts your brain structure. It impacts your brain structure in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that's what you see on the left, and in men also impacts that brain structure we've just discussed, perigenual cingulate cortex. These uh, two brain structures were smaller in the urban born. Now, that of course raises the question of how does that work? What are the causes of 
these findings in brain, especially if, as we've said at the outset, we would like to do prevention. We would like to stop the city environment from being deleterious with regard to mental health. And if we want to do that, we need to be quick. We have an urgent problem because urbanization is rapidly proceeding. It used to be, of course, that throughout human history, most people lived in rural circumstances. Just a few years back, around 2011, that mankind crossed the threshold, as you can see on the right panel here, where more people live in the city than in the country. And by 2050, it's going to be two-thirds of people who live in big cities. A process not driven so much by Europe and North America, which are very urbanized already, but especially by Asia and by China, in which many, many people are getting and being urbanized. So if you think back about what we said at the beginning about the risk increase that city living and city birth gives you with regard to mental disorders, you need to be finding out ideas of what could you change in the urban environment to make it better for mental health. And to do that, we've started a study uh, a few years back now, which is still ongoing, which is trying to find some answers to this problem. And what we did in the study is to use smartphones uh, with GPS signal enabled to track people in cities. So we knew during uh, the week that such a session usually entails where in the city or in the countryside they currently are. And we use that phone to ask them how they are doing. Uh, we use a method called momentary, ecological momentary assessment, which means that several times during the day, the phone will vibrate and people will then ask to tell us what their mood is, what their stress level is, uh, whether they're with other people or alone, what they're doing, these kinds of questions. So we know how they've been feeling and where in the city they've been. And together with collaborators in this study from the University of Heidelberg, we have made a lot of maps that show us potentially relevant aspects of urban life. So we have maps of green space, we have maps of traffic patterns, we have maps of socioeconomic status, ethnic uh, contributions to uh, who lives in that part of town, and so on. So we collect data on people's experiences in the city in that socio-geographic context, if you will. And after that week, we study their brain using the techniques I've just introduced to you. And that has the advantage that we don't have to wait for these people to get sick, to have a mental illness or not. We can look in their brain and find a quantitative measure that we think is related to risk. And uh, when the study started, uh, nature uh, uh, in a uh, editorial related to the topic uh, made this picture of, of this idea and you can see someone standing there next to a tree who's relaxed or someone who's annoyed because it's close to a road and someone lonely next to the skyscraper and of course it isn't quite as simple as that figure would suggest but that's the general idea we would like to understand who feels how and what circumstances and which of the context variables and cities are to blame for it with the goal of maybe doing something about it. And I would like to highlight one especially salient uh, factor in cities that we have found has a big impact on well-being, and that is nature experience in cities, urban green space. This is a paper uh, done by uh, collaborators in Stanford, which uh, looked at a group of people who were either told to go in the uh, countryside or told to go to the city. And they used a method called arterial spin labeling, which allows you to uh, very nicely measure uh, brain blood flow before and after that intervention. And you can see on the left that that again hit that experimental manipulation hit that area in the perigenial cingulate cortex. And they found that that change in perigenial cingulate cortex mediated a striking improvement in those people's well-being and even their cognitive function. They were doing quite a lot better uh, with regard to mood and also with regard to executive cognition just by virtue of this short walk highlighting both the benefits of being exposed to nature and the benefits 
of uh, uh, that or the, the role of that specific brain area. Now, that is a controlled experiment. Uh, in our study, we can see whether the same thing happens in the natural environment. And the answer is that the same thing happens. So this is looking at people moving freely in the city or in the country. And you can see that practically everyone feels better when they're exposed to more urban green space. So the x-axis, you see urban green space density, on uh, the left, uh, on the uh, y-axis, you can see how they're feeling, and all of almost all of those lines are pointing up. So the more green space, the better they feel. But uh, of interest, the slope of those lines is very different. So some people benefit a lot from urban green space. Uh, some people benefit only a little, and that green space gain, if you will, is an interesting thing that you can then interrogate with regard to what's going on in brain and also the circumstances of those people. And what we found is that those people who benefit most from being exposed to urban green space are people who are at risk for mental illness and who are deficient in regulating their emotions in an emotion regulation task. They were deficient in recruiting, especially dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, to inhibit their emotional response. And so the idea is that urban green space provides a regulatory mechanism for them that they cannot access on their own. And in agreement with that idea, we find that these people also show some other risk factors for mental illness, for example, they have a higher tendency to react anxiously when stressed, something that's called harm avoidance or also neuroticism. And that was also related to uh, the degree in which their brain reacted this way. And we then asked where in the city are those people? As they go around the day, do they cluster in certain aspects of the city? And what we found is you can see that on the lower panel of graphs that they clustered in a part of the city, which is marked by a red arrow, uh, sorry, a red circle, which is a high risk area. That's an area of high uh, uh, psychiatric risk, social deprivation, several risk factors come together here. This is where those people habitually are. And this is an area with especially little urban green space. So that suggests that if you only have a given number of trees to distribute, if you want to actually do prevention, you can do that targeted by targeting uh, your prevention efforts on those parts of town which uh, show high deprivation and low green space, which is an interesting uh, uh, aspect from the point of view of social psychiatry and prevention. Now, I've talked to you about uh, social status and cities. I would like to give you one last example of risk factor, which also brings together some of those mechanisms. And that example is migration. After being born in a city, the uh, second strongest risk factor for schizophrenia is whether or not you live in the city you have been born in, so whether or not you're a first-generation migrant, or even whether your parent was a first-generation migrant. And that increases your risk for schizophrenia to something around 270, 280, or in the case of the second-generation uh, migrant, a little higher, even 300%. And you can already tell from the fact that the second generation migrants are at risk that this doesn't have anything to do with pre-migratory factors. How was your life in your country of origin? And also not with the stress of migrating. This has to do with the post-migratory phase. It has to do with living in a country whose interaction to social structure is different from the one of your country of birth, if you're a first-generation migrant, or different from the one that still characterized the family you were brought up in, in the case of the second-generation migrant. So we actually do a lot of work with refugees uh, these days. And in refugees, of course, you have additional problems that come through hardship in the country they were displaced from and also during their flight. But what we're talking about now isn't about that. This is about looking at the post-migratory phase. And, of course, this is something very different 
from being born in a city. But these two things have that in common, that they increase the risk for the same uh, psychiatric disorder similarity. So you can now use neuroscience to ask a simple question. Okay, if you look in brain, is the effect of these two risk factors very similar or is it very different? If it is very similar, you've learned something and in the other case as well. So we performed an experiment adapted to the migrant situation in which we were uh, again using a social stress paradigm to look at the reaction of a group of second generation migrant and matched non-migrants in this case in, in our home country of Germany. And what we found is that we looked at the social stress response, the impact on brain was exactly the same as the one that we found in uh, the urban born. It's again that area of perigenous cingulate cortex that is hyperreactive in migrants and brain areas that are linked to it. We talked about amygdala before, but here I would like to highlight one other brain area that you can see in panel C, and that is called ventral striatum. And that is interesting because the ventral striatum is a brain area which is linked to the emergence of psychosis in a very similar way that hyperreactive amygdala is linked to the emergence of depression and anxiety disorder. And the way this works is that we know from groundbreaking work by Wolfram Schulz that a dopamine signal in brain is critical for indicating to the brain important event, salient events uh, in the environment and therefore triggers a response where you attend to these important events. And in schizophrenia, as shown here, an elegant uh, study by Graham Murray and co-workers, this response is dysregulated. You have more response to irrelevant stimuli, and that is probably what leads you down the way to psychosis because you're constantly having the impression something important is going on because that salient system is chaotically upregulated, but there isn't actually anything going on, but you feel compelled to attend to this, and that leads you on the road to delusions, for example. So an exaggerated ventral strider response is a final pathway, a final pathophysiological pathway on the way to psychosis, similar to what a hyperreactive amygdala does as a final common pathway on uh, the road to depression anxiety disorders. Now, this suggests that in migrants, when they are socially stressed, they should release more dopamine into striatum. And that is something actually found in a collaborative study uh, with colleagues in Canada and the UK, uh, which used PET uh, together with the social stress task of the kind of shown you here to find that uh, non-immigrants when socially stressed release dopamine too. You can see that in the panel on the left, let it be known. But immigrants when socially stressed release a lot more, a much, much stronger dopamine release, indicating that, in fact, there might be a dysregulation of uh, the dopamine response to social stress that puts immigrants at an increased risk for psychosis. And you can see this again in the scatter plot here, not only the release of dopamine, but also the synthesis of dopamine is increased in that population. And just as immigrants had the same functional impact that the urban born had. They also had a very, very similar structural impact, which again was situated in the medial prefrontal cortex, especially in men, as you can see here in this publication. So both in structure and in function, the impact of migration and of urbanicity were very similar. And also the third risk factor that I talked to you about links there, social status. I've already talked to you about our functional imaging data, which in this slide you can see on the lower right. But at a similar time, a study was done by Amat Hariri and colleagues in which people map perceived social status on a ladder that you can see here on brain structure. And they again found that part on perigenous singlet cortex being impacted to your perceived social standing in the society's hierarchy. This is something we can replicate 
in our migrants, but then we can add one interesting facet to it, which is that in migrants, and especially in refugees, there's often a change between the social status when they were born, the social status of their parents, and the ones that they have attained as adults, be it because they have moved for economic opportunity, so they have improved their social status, or for refugees, often they have been displaced, and their status has suffered. And if we look at that interaction between social standing now and at birth, it again maps on the perigenous cingulate cortex. You can see that here, and it is actually mediated by, uh, by the impact of that brain area by virtue of chronic stress. So we again see this link between chronic social stress, that specific brain area, and the third risk factor that I've talked to you about, status. So if we put all of that together in a model, it suggests that uh, ethnic minority status, but the same would happen to uh, urban birth through social adversities and an interaction with genetic and epigenetic factors leads to a sensitization in a specific brain area and a specific system that the brain area regulates, which then, if acute stress hits you in adulthood, leads to the manifestation of psychosis by virtue of dysregulation of the dopamine response. Now, unfortunately, I only have time to talk about the three specific risk factors. I'd just like to point out to you that there are many other childhood adversities, sexual uh, misconduct, uh, 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 there's uh, poverty, things like that. And they also impact the brain in various ways, but they all tended to converge on that area of the perigenial cingulate cortex again, which we have come to think of in summary now as the centerpiece shown here in blue of a circuitry that mediates uh, environmental risk. And that's also impacted on, although that hasn't been uh, much in the focus of today's talk, by genetic risk factors. So it's a convergent risk system. Now, having that and returning to the topic of our presentation, how can we use that to improve people's well-being? How can we use that to improve resilience? Now, the first resilience factor that you should probably ask for is social interactions. If the social network is good for you, if social stress is bad for you, is there a positive effect of the size of the social network on that circuitry? And it turns out that there is. That's a, a study from 2010 in which the researchers showed the more friends you have, the bigger your social network is, the bigger is your amygdala and actually also part of the prefrontal cortex. And that applies not only to real friends, it even applies, although in a weaker fashion, to uh, people you only know virtually to, through uh, Facebook, for example, other social networks. So more people are good for you in this sense. That motivates a great interest that we are having, a lot of people are having, in actually looking at what do these social interactions do to the brain. And to do that, we are using a method called hyperscanning, uh, which uses two fMRI scanners, one subject in each of those scanners, and studies uh, both of them, why they interact through an audio-video uplink with each other. And uh, this has been a thorny analysis problem to try and quantify how does information flow from which part of one person's brain to the other person's brain during that interaction. But this is something uh, that we and others have been working on. We now think we have a relatively good idea on how we can analyze these complicated data sets to look at various ways of social interaction. You can look at something very simple shown on top here. This is something called joint attention, where someone looks where that other person is looking at. That's very simple form of, if you will, social cooperation that's important in development for uh, helping children to develop more complicated capabilities in social cognition, such as theory of mind. But you can also look at interactions shown below in which you're not just doing that, but you're actually trying to achieve a common goal or uh, to, to establish cooperation or try to have an antagonistic interaction in which you will trying to win something from another person. And uh, the final point I would like to make is using this method, uh, we looked at the interaction between immigrants and non-immigrants, between migrants and hosts. And what we found in the study is that 
the brain systems that support the social interactions between migrants and non-migrants are the same that support interactions between uh, groups of non-migrants or groups of migrants talking to one another and it prominently includes as you can see on the left again those parts of the medial prefrontal cortex in addition to some other brain areas important to social cognition such as the temporal parietal junction but if you then look at how successful the interaction is and you can look at that in a brain way by looking at neural coupling how much of uh, the information uh, from one brain to another gets over then how efficiently are they coupled. You find that if migrants and non-migrants interact, uh, there's no difference for simple forms of interaction. But if you have an interaction that involves trust, then the neural coupling, and you can see that on the left, uh, on the right, is completely predicted by cultural distance. The closer the two people are culturally, the better the interaction works on the level of brain. And conversely, and this is, I think, a very interesting finding for digging deeper, and this is something that we now do in a bunch of projects into those interactions between migrants and tourists, which have become a major societal topic in my country, as perhaps they are in yours and need to be studied, not just from the point of view of the migrants and their risk, which is what we have been focused on, but also with a view of what do these kinds of interactions do with the host, especially if they haven't been exposed to migrants a lot in the past. So in summary, what I've tried to show you is a set of studies looking at a range of risk factors associated with severe mental disorders. And the point wasn't so much about those specific exposures. You could have uh, looked at totally different ones. I've shown you some examples. We could have looked at genes. But the point is that you can use neuroscience to define brain systems of risk and that those brain systems of risk, and we've discussed this in the context of the urbanicity effect, might give you a clue on how to prevent and intervene in these common and severe disorders in the future. With that, let me thank the funders of this work, which you can see in the left, and my co-workers in my lab, which you can see on the right, which have been instrumental in this work. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Meyer Lindenberg, for that informative presentation. I would like to pose some audience questions to you. First one is, what about the relation between genetic risk for mental disorders and the environmental factors you talk about? That's an excellent question. Uh, many psychiatric disorders have a large genetic contribution. Schizophrenia, for example, genetic contribution is like 70 to 80 percent, and others not depression, the genetic contribution is uh, only about a third, but it's always there. So the question is, how do genes and environment interact? And the answer is, interestingly, that genes tend to hit that same circus, both common genetic variants, uh, for example, CSA-NA1C, and rare variants, copy number variants, in our hands, as in those of many uh, other labs around the world tend to hit similar structures. So what that would predict in terms of risk is that you already carry certain risk genes. You might be more at risk for environmental exposure by virtue of an impact on the same circuit. And the same applies for resilience genes. If you have a gene that improves the function of that circuit, it might also improve your resilience against that risk factor. So there's a dynamic interplay. We know that from epidemiology, but we can map it to the brain just as we can map the environmental effects on the brain. Thank you. Next is, what can people do to reduce their risk in cities? Yeah, that's a good question. If you hear these numbers, uh, schizophrenia risk goes up by triple, depression risk goes up by 40 percent. The thing that you obviously usually can't do is just move out of the city because it would get very crowded in the countryside uh, because we've seen that more people live uh, live uh, in cities now than in the countryside. It's also, also not feasible. Uh, some things that you can do uh, relate to the resilience factors we've already found. So, for example, attending to green space and very little 
Central is actually enough. You don't have to take a long hike to Central Park. It's quite enough to actually just look uh, with a degree uh, of mindfulness at a tree. Uh, appears to have a measurable effect. Uh, there's basic mechanisms of stress resilience, things like mindfulness, uh, time planning. Uh, these things uh, are often useful. And so there's a lot that you can do in the city environment to make it better. We're currently looking at other effects such as, uh, for example, traffic, uh, how do you get from A to B, uh, things that relate to social interactions, but those would be some simple suggestions in the event that you're unlucky enough to live in a city and can't immediately move out. Well, thank you. Any other questions that were submitted today for our speaker will be followed up via email. Thank you again, Dr. Meyer Lindenberg, for your presentation, and thank you, LabRoots, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June 14th, 2019. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.